We're going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the markets, uh, why they're happening, and what the impact on those of you in the audience may be, and, and perhaps even what the impact on the world's economy may be. We'll try to keep it provocative, uh, a little progressive, a little disruptive ourselves. We know it's after lunch, so we'll move quickly. I think maybe 20 minutes of panel discussion followed by 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. If at any time during the panel you feel a pressing desire to uh, ask a particularly pointed question, please do so. There are individuals in the back of the room with uh, microphones. Uh, I think I see them. Everybody would turn back there. And if, who has the microphones? Uh, they are, oh, they've got the pad. There you are. They've got the paddles, too. So if you ask a bad question, uh, the paddles will be employed. <laughs> and we've seen a lot of, a lot of um, we'll start off with, with why now? Why is it that there's so much interest, gentlemen, in, in disruption? Why, why do we feel that, why is there such an immediate and pressing focus on working capital in particular? Mark, how are you seeing this uh, from the eyes of a practitioner for many years in this space? Uh, why has this become such a hot topic presently? Uh, well, I think it's a hot topic back in 2008 when the, the markets all went belly up, to tell the truth. And we'll talk about supply chain fi <coughs> finance as a solution. I was uh, talking about it quite widely, uh, saying that it's a win-win-win for both the, the buyers, suppliers, and, and also the banks involved in it. Uh, why now? It hasn't really worked. And I've got a, a banker next to me, so um, a lot of those solutions are coming from the banking world. But I think we've had limited uh, coverage from the suppliers in terms of uh, adoption, so they can get to the buying organisations can get quite good returns from just doing it with their top 10, maybe 20 or 30 suppliers in terms of a working capital improvement. But actually looking at the finances of, of the suppliers and reducing the cost of capital mm. hasn't achieved that. I think there's a huge gap that needs to come through. We've seen stuff coming through from the government around prompt payment, um, which is great for them. They've made some, some advances in terms of paying suppliers early. I think probably at the, the risk of uh, the taxpayers having to, to pay for that. Um, but there's a real need to look at the, the cost of capital for suppliers, being a customer of choice and helping to empower supply chains so they could drive more value to, to both the buying organisation but also their customers as well. And I also think there's a change. Disruptions coming across, technologies driving that. I think now is a time that technology can really have that connectivity with the suppliers and allow them to have the optionality to actually pull down cash when they need it from their, their customers as well. As a reformed banker, a recovering banker, one of the two, I, I won't take much umbrage at your comment about the banks because I know you're really just talking about Rene. Rene, why, <laughs> why, have, why have the bank programs not worked? What would you say to that? Um, yeah, I, anything I say, because I am the token banker here, you won't believe. But um, let, let me just share with you my experience. Ten years ago, um, I started supplier finance within Lloyds Bank. Probably one of the sort of biggest challenges I faced was internal. It was the fact that we had a market-leading factoring and invoice discounting business, which was very successful. And some of our management were kind of worried that I'd be cannibalizing that book. Uh, and they didn't initially believe me when I said all the market research points to the fact that actually supplier finance will reach suppliers, the largest number of which will not factor, have made a conscious decision not to receive all finance in the traditional way. Really, Rene? I said, yeah. You know, however good this business is for you, just look at how clunky it is. And, you know, the managing director of our factoring business used to love it when I came up to him and said, hi, you know, remember me? You know, we, we do receivable financing without the pain. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what really happened? Well, what really happened was we showed our bank that by using very efficient systems, we can actually process massive volume of transactions and issue early payment financing out to suppliers. And the other joke, you know, every now and again I come into the office and I say, I and all of my team are going to go on holiday for a month. And you know what? We will continue to fund the suppliers. It is a straight through process that enables us to truly lend at very competitive rates. Now, there are other reasons for the competitive pricing, but a key element is how efficient a well run supply chain finance <coughs> platform makes your financing business. What percentage, uh, Renee, you can answer this, or maybe Tim, you've seen a, a fair amount of this. What percentage of the suppliers are typically covered by a supply chain financing program? 
I would say between 20 and 40 to 50 percent. So if you've got 50 percent of a particular buying organization, suppliers signed up, that's a really, really strong program. So anywhere between kind of 20 and 40 percent take up. And one of the most interesting aspects of getting into this business from the start and, and watching it through the last kind of nine years and, and through, you know, through the cycle, and we're clearly on the upturn now, so you know, we're watching all of this, is that it's rather counterintuitive. When we first started, we thought that particularly SME suppliers who weren't being served by us, the bank, would have our right arm off to sign up to these programs. It's really not that easy. There's, there, there has been a lot of suspicion against supplier finance. That's changing as more programs are out there. But there's quite a number of cash-rich, medium-sized and small businesses. So actually, the take-up, what's preventing us get to kind of 70 or 80 percent is in part at least that there isn't yet that cash requirement in a lot of UK businesses. Tim. <clears throat> so Renee's saying I think that the banks are doing a fairly good job at this and in fact that some of these businesses may not even need uh, that cash and yet we have uh, number 10 and uh, political pressure coming from all sorts of directions to get suppliers paid sooner. So there's certainly an implication that there's something still fundamentally flawed in the system how, uh, how has KPMG responded to this? So we, <coughs> well, we um, are out, out talking to our clients uh, all the time. And we are hearing the same story from a number of these clients every time we talk to them about this particular area. And that's that the existing methods of supporting their suppliers to access working capital um, is doesn't, doesn't work as well as they would like it to. It works very well for some of the larger suppliers that they have. Um, and you know, we, hear, we hear slightly different figures to, to Renee. Um, and, and for the people who do have it in place, we hear figures of sort of 10, maybe as high as 20% of the supplier base being supported by uh, supply chain finance platforms. Um, and we also find clients who, for one reason or another, don't use or haven't even heard of supply chain finance platforms. And the reasons why these, these bigger companies aren't using or aren't thinking about these platforms is because you have to get finance to talk to and agree with procurement, um, and then maybe there's somebody who's head of supply chain as well who has to, has to agree to this. Um, and then, you know, if you can get the heads of those very busy departments together, uh, you then got to try and rope in the IT department, and then you say there's, there's, you know, there's an IT integration process that needs to be done. Um, it, it's, it's always second or third on the agenda of busy people in, you know, in, in busy companies. So we figured that there was a role for KPMG to come along and act as a, as a, as a project manager, as an implementer, if you like, because we know all of those particular individuals within a firm. We, uh, we have the trust of those individuals, generally speaking. Um, and we also are increasingly... Uh, developing a presence in the digital space. So what we, our response to these issues that our clients are talking to us about is to say, well, we, we will help you uh, project manage, we will help you implement a supply chain finance solution. And in order to overcome some of the resistance uh, from uh, your IT department about you know, how the, the, the challenges of implementing a big IT platform, we will introduce you to world-class digital technology. And when, when we're talking about digital, what we mean in this context is something that's easy to implement, takes a matter of weeks rather than months to implement, and then once it's implemented, it's really easy to use. So we, um, we have formed an alliance with, uh, with uh, C2FO, with Sandy's company, to, to take their digital proposition, combine it with our relationships and our suite of advisory services, uh, to come, and come into our bigger clients and help them implement a supplier financing solution that helps them support their supply base. Steve, you deal uh, with a lot of shared services professionals. I know you've got almost 20,000 who are members of your community. What are they thinking about this, this push towards supply chain finance and disruptive working capital markets? Aren't they really more about sharing services and creating efficiencies inside their own organization? Why now are they so focused on what's happening? Or maybe they're not. Are they focused on what's mm. happening with their suppliers? I, I think the mature ones are beginning to get there. I, I think um, there's a kind of a two-tier issue here, really. The companies that are large enough for the banks to want to work with, 
are so disorganized in their back office processes that they've driven this kind of shared services uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. And that agenda has been based around cutting transaction costs initially, and, and it hasn't been looking at many other, many other parts of, of where they can make more money. So you look at a shared service centre that it consolidates God knows how many countries' services into one area. It, it, you know, eight years down the line, they've consolidated maybe onto one ERP, and they've got 70% you know, purchase order compliance, and they've got some processes that they understand. Um, at that point, they start looking at how do we offer a better quality service to our, our business, and, and they are beginning to looking at supply chain finance. But I think the second tier below that, so we're talking there about, say, the, the, the biggest 7,000 companies in the world, so it's a pretty big, anybody over a billion dollars fundamentally is, is in that state, so they're, they're focused on processes. Procurement and finance are still, largely speaking, not aligned in those organisations, so you quite often see finance and, uh, you know, F&A in the shared service centre, but not procurement, and if they are, they... They don't, they don't work terribly well together. So they're, they're really focusing on processes. The interesting thing is, from a perspective of digitalization and all the rest of it, they're also the only companies that, who have back office processes that are well enough defined to be able to do very much around connecting suppliers and buyers together. So it's, just a, it's still just a, a, a journey that's got to move beyond we've got our processes defined and we're cutting costs and we're cutting costs to something that's more important to the business. I think the next tier down, uh, companies that probably you know might be simpler to to uh, to look at supply chain financing and the banks haven't been quite so interested in dealing with them because of the credit risk so now with uh, you know technology coming along that's helping facilitate some of this the agenda's changing a little bit so it's a little, bit, little bit easier now well. maybe to, to the points that were being made previously yeah <clears throat> so I, the question as you think about the uh, in particular the UK economy which is why we're here Plus or minus $3 trillion tied up on the books of the, the of British businesses uh, on any given day in accounts receivable. What is the cost and how do you, how do you measure this? Maybe we'll, Renee, we'll come back to you. How do you measure the economic cost of $3 trillion of illiquidity on the books of British businesses on any given day? I, I don't know the answer to that. As this was not on the list, I but, apologize. But, uh, yeah, that's right, so where are my notes? Um, what, what are the, just to get to that point, one of the things that we do when we present supplier finance is we give suppliers a calculator. So the supplier can go in and say, right, at the moment I'm giving this particular customer 60 days credit and they can sneakily insert their cost of borrowing into that calculator. <laughs> and then they can look at the cost of the supplier finance programme which will be predicated not on the value of their balance sheet, but the value of the balance sheet of the bar, because that's the bank's risk. Mm -hmm. And the saving to that supplier in terms of the reduction in the cost of capital, the cost of giving the credit to the buyer, is substantially lower, substantially reduced. So the, the arbitrage, um, therefore, to get to your point, you know, the yeah. cost... Uh, is, is significant and can be significantly reduced. But, you know, actually, and I keep saying to our buyers, who, because I'm a banker, will never believe me, supplier finance isn't, in terms of how it's priced, that price sensitive. The fact of the matter is that most businesses... When I, when I was in my 20s and came to the city, cash is king. It's still uh, king. Hmm. Never mind be, the cost. Might be king and queen. I, I need to get to my cash. And just if I may, sort of make one, one more point. Um, the government's interest... I had two dreams in my 20s. One was that I'd be invited for tea at the Bank of England and the others that I'd be invited to 10 Downing Street. I've achieved both. That's the degree of interest there is on part of government and the Bank of England in supply chain finance. The lesson I learnt in my days in the trade credit insurance industry is in the economic cycle, business failures get higher and higher, we all expect this, going into an economic <coughs> downturn. But actually, history has proven that business failures also rise significantly on the upturn because those businesses that have survived have to somehow grow as quickly as their customers are growing. And if they don't have the liquidity to do that, they're dead. Yeah. Mark, I want to come back to the liquidity issue. We know, at least I can't speak precisely to the amount of uh, C&I, commercial industrial loans on the books of the UK banks, maybe Renee can. I know, Mark, you and I have chatted about this. In the United States, 
Uh, it's maybe 300, 400 billion dollars available for working capital finance. Uh, assuming sort of economic parity with uh, Great Britain, you might have 100, 200 billion of funding available for working capital across all the banks and including supply chain programs. Uh, so, Renee, you've addressed, you've addressed a, a brilliant part of what SCF does, which is reduce the cost of, of capital, cost of borrowing for those who are borrowing. How about for those who aren't borrowing? We have $3 trillion of accounts receivable on the books here of the businesses of the United Kingdom. We have maybe a hundred, two hundred billion of traditional finance. How do we solve for the rest, Mark? For the suppliers who are trying to get cash? Yeah, it's three trillion dollars of accounts receivable out there. Certainly those folks would like to have cash instead of accounts receivable. How do we get cash to those suppliers? Well, I think it needs to be a lot more dynamic. Um, so supply chain finance, we can say whether it's been successful or, or not. I, I think uh, the banks have been great in terms of putting their invoice factoring in over the last eight years. So one of the reasons why those small business may not want you jumping on the supply chain finance programs is because they legally can't because they've already sold their invoices to an invoice factoring solution. So I would weigh up whether or not they're not biting off your arm for that, for that side. I think it's offering these programs through, and, and I guess what we're looking at in terms of this technology and, and where the, the world can go forward is I, I like to relate this to Uber. There's a market, and Uber's one of the most you know, high growth companies and valuations going in the world. They've created a market around me needing a, a trip to go somewhere and drivers. Um, and I can see the price of that, and if it's a, a busy time, the price goes up. And I can make the choice, I'm still gonna get a taxi and pay a little bit more to, to take that, that ride, but I'm not gonna be left on the road waiting for the next black cab to come along. I think that same thing needs to come to, to smaller organizations to actually borrow from their customers, where they have the choice and optionality to do it, and can see it and have the transparency of the cost. And you can't see, it, well, invoice factoring, you're selling all your invoices. <coughs> And if you're lucky enough to get onto the supply chain finance program, you're not bound to one of those programs, you then can get it, but you're selling probably all your invoices through on the invoice factoring side as well. So I think there needs to be optionality. I think the, the large buying organisations have got cash. They need to work out that they can reduce the cost to their suppliers and really empower them by saying, look, we're going to work with you, go and do great R&D, work with us and come up with great solutions for ourselves and our customers, but they need the technology around it. So we have to, to open up these markets and enable it through technology. We can't do it through paper-based things or big ERP systems that are going to be really slow. It needs to be dynamic and they're on their mobiles or, or thereabouts to, to actually access and make those decisions. I run a small businesses, you know, procurement leaders, Old Street Labs, small businesses. I work with large businesses, 90 days. Would I like to get paid early? Yes, it helps my working capital so I can innovate for them. Do I want to then get paid by a corporate credit card? Great for them, and then pay 5% on top? No, there needs to be a mindset change from the buying organisations. I think that comes from the CFOs at the top who have been focused so much on their working capital position and hoarding cash over the years. Now's their opportunity to actually make some money out of that cash that's sitting there and also empower their suppliers. So I think that's the change that needs to come through, and it has to come through from large organisations understanding the opportunity that's there. And, and Tim, as the, uh, as the accounting expert here, let me, let me question, does everyone's AP equal someone else's AR? I, I think that's absolutely right. That's just yeah. the opposite side absolutely. of the balance. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we address that? Can we create risk-free funding, therefore, to the supplier if we're dealing with approved invoices in a marketplace mm -hmm. where the supplier might be able to ask for that cash? Large, your large corporate buyers, what are they making on their excess cash now? They're making, um, you know, we, we hear a, a range of different numbers depending on the, the understanding of the question with some of our uh, uh, <coughs> clients, but um, it's typically in the region of 50 basis points, Sandy. Yeah. And we, we also, um, you know, we're, we, when we're talking to our bigger clients, one of the other issues that we're coming up, uh, that, that we're hearing uh, many times is, exactly as Mark says, what do we do, how do we efficiently invest this cash that we have on our balance sheet for in, in the short-term market, because if you're only earning 50 basis points on it, what do we do? We, we hear that request to help us, Tim, figure out something to do with this cash, driven in some cases by the amount of cash that these big corporates are sitting on. And one corporate I was speaking to you last week is actually running up against their own internal counterparty credit limits with the banks. So having to broaden out their portfolio of banks that they have relationships with because they need somewhere uh, to keep the cash and don't want too much exposure 
to any individual bank within the banking sector. So these are real pressing issues that the, bank, that the corporates are facing every day. And Steve, you had said that the informed or uh, more evolved corporate leaders are looking at the extended supply chain as if it was part of their own organization. So it seems to make sense that they should care about the securing of funding and the pricing of funding for their suppliers. So where do you see this a year or two from now? Well, I, I think there are some, it's like all of these things, if you want a network, which ostensibly this is what this is, to go to really accelerate, everything in it has to be easy. And right now, there are lots of dynamics between the buyers and the suppliers and the processes that's underneath it, which are not easy. You've got treasuries, treasurers that have uh, DSO <coughs> targets and KPIs, which are not, not congruent with the idea of uh, dynamic discounting. Uh, you've, got, you've got banks sitting in the middle that uh, see the small suppliers as too expensive to connect to, so they don't want to do the, the infrastructure stuff. But technology is changing, so, that, so that's being easier. I, I, I see the model needing to be um, suppliers being able to make independent decisions to, to be financed earlier, and buyers making independent decisions of their suppliers. And I would like to see, personally, somebody come up with a, uh, a solution that includes supply chain financing, dynamic discounting, reverse factoring and factoring, so that you can actually choose based on what either side's position is at any time to make a decision to actually manage your cash better. I think that would make a massive difference to the market, and I think that would open up some possibilities of this accelerating quicker as well. I think we would all agree, all of this, at this panel would agree that a choice solution allowing for optionality between buyers and suppliers makes a tremendous amount of sense. Mm. So we'll close on that and open up for uh, the last five or six minutes for a Q&A. You have some wonderful leaders here, ladies and gentlemen. Please get them some tough questions. An alternative thing I've seen of late, I work for the Discovery Channel, um, and one of the things we're looking at is our whole working capital structure. And we've been approached by both uh, American Express and MasterCard to uh, look at a v-payment solution. And one of the things they're leading with there is the notion, well, your supplier gets paid on day one, and you don't have to pay us till day 56. And like this, this seems far too good for everybody. And I think the pushback we're having is, is surely for this to work, everybody in that chain has to gain something. And I think at the minute, the balance isn't quite right, but they're getting there. I think the discussion's healthy. I think it's, 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 it's got some legs to run, but it's, it seems like an alternative to what we're, we're talking about today with regards to the direct supplier funding. I think that's an extra string to the bow. I might, I might uh, ask my accounting friend here to check my math, but if there's a 3% interchange to be paid 60 days early, it's an 18% APR that's being charged to the supplier. We've, we've all agreed, and we've done the numbers, as I say, and certainly yeah. we've, we've been beating up very heavily on, on the credit card companies saying, your traditional margins can't work in this market space, so it's, it's, it's not viable. We, we, we agree that we, we need to shade our margin in relation to that supplier, so we've got some give there, but you two are. So unless all three are prepared to give in some instance, there, there's no framework. I agree. And I think that you'll see some compromise. I think these gentlemen were suggesting that there should be a, a platform of choice for the supplier. Maybe some suppliers will enjoy being paid via P card. Uh, others might enjoy expressing their orders in a marketplace, yet others being constant participants inside an SCF program. But the good news is, for whatever reason, it, it, here and around the world, very bright minds are beginning to work, it, work it and deal with this issue. And I think it has a lot less to do with the R between banks and borrowing rates, but just the, the fact that really, literally, coming back to it, $3 trillion stranded in liquidity on the books of, the, of British businesses. Okay, can, can, can I come in and, and just sort of... Um... Yeah, my, my view on all of this is that you know, here we are, Lloyd's supply chain finance. We, you know, we, we have a, a model that really suits the large strategic suppliers, <clears throat> the total supply chain. We can absolutely see where dynamic discounting would fit and it would kind of butt up and maybe cross over a little bit at the higher end and go down the tail. And we also see procurement cards, P cards, sitting probably closer to the end of the tail. And, uh, yeah. and kind of in a very simple picture, that's what it kind of looks like at the moment. I think the challenge, you know, one of the reasons I'm here, and the challenge for us all, is to work together and find ways of delivering to you, the customer, some kind of sensible joined up solution. Because at the end of the day, whether you've got one tool or you've got three or four, you're going to have to make some decisions about if you've got 10,000 suppliers, kind of who gets offered what and how do they get offered it. Uh, and, and our challenge is to join all of this up in a way that you can say, that, that, that makes sense now. I think just, just to add to that, Sonny, that what, one of the issues here is a process issue. Um, you, nobody's going to be actually financing a non-approved invoice, I'm guessing. So 
you know, there's, there's a process of reconciling an invoice to approve it that has to happen for, this, for all of this to work properly. And it's one of the reasons why the shared services market's so important here, because they are the ones that have got their PO approval stuff in and decent compliance. And so you do get a decent number of invoices approved quite quickly. Um, without that happening on the buy side, unless more companies actually get that process streamlined, I suppose, it's going to be very difficult to, um, for the rest of it to work well. Let's pause for a second. We have a question here. Um, just touching on, I think a point was raised earlier on, I think, by Mark about, for me in procurement, it's convincing my CFO to release the money. You know, they're very focused, I think, certainly in downturn in terms of instant looking of, I've got to build up my balance sheet, I need cash. Yep. I'm not going to spend it with anybody else. So I think there's, their concern is who's paying for it and who's earning out of it and what am I going to get out of it on my balance sheet. So I think for me, it's the challenge of convincing Treasury CFOs and procurement and getting them aligned on what is it we can actually achieve by looking at various sort of finance models, um, not so much helping our bigger strategic suppliers, but more the, the SME and the medium-sized market where really that innovation is there. It's not really there as much I see at the high-end or billion-dollar companies. It's yeah. that market, the SME, and that... I suppose the, the cash flowing through to them that then starts bubbling up to the surface. If you, uh, said, if you said to your treasurer that uh, you're making 10 or 20 or 30 basis points and yet we could create a 600, 700 basis point risk-free yield by paying our suppliers early against approved invoices, it's not a question of whether you're going to pay the invoice, it's a question of when. And if you could monetize the win to the tune of 6 to 7% APRs and account for it as a reduction of cost of goods, which is what you would do because it's discount income, then you've got an EBITDA metric that should be very powerful for your operating chiefs as well. Others that would recommend? I think it's worth looking at that. I mean, the most supply chain finance programs come up <coughs> alongside a standardization of payment terms. And that may be standardization of payment terms the one farthest out, which is normally a common practice around it. Um, uh, so your CFO or your, your business has already done that. I think if you look at, and it's interesting to look where there's a, an optional clause for suppliers to actually pull down on it, and I've looked at some of the programs, some C2FO, which is one of the only programs I've seen where you have the optionality and the growth of those programs over a three to four year period of suppliers actually pulling down on that money over a period of time when they have the option is pretty interesting. And that's the type of stuff that I would take to your treasury or finance about how you actually can earn money out of it by potentially disintermediating the banks from it who are taking nice cash. If they're sitting in the middle, they're making some money somewhere. Believe me. Um, I think we all know that. So if you can actually connect directly with your su suppliers and you can actually make some money, but you're actually empowering your suppliers, you're, you're giving them, you're giving them a, a cheaper cost of credit than yeah. they are currently having. And actually, you're getting a return out of it. Mostly on a supply chain finance program, the only return you're getting is by the standardization or extending your payment terms and the banks making the money on the, the program because they're funding it. I think it's just changing that dynamic of treasury and finance to say, look, here's an ability to empower our supply chain and for us to make some money and see the option for the suppliers as well. OK, Rene, tell us, tell us uh, how you would respond. In, in terms of the, you know, what's in it for, for finance and treasury, um, well, you've already heard a, a, a much better return than parking it with Lloyd's Bank or, frankly, any other bank. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we'll be less profitable in the future if this cash is on. Um, your, your procurement, right? Yes. So my understanding in procurement is, you know, whenever you're having a price negotiation, you, you might even go as far as an open book pricing and say, I need to understand your costs, Mr. Supplier, in order to be able to sign off your price. And if I'm an apple grower and you're a big supermarket and you say you take a look at my um, you know, crop spraying equipment, you just say, look, you're paying too much for, for, for your, your chemicals, I can supply that more cheaply. Well, it's the same with cash. So if you move from the physical into the financial, you and your organisation have a huge bucket of cash and you're able to use that to help me reduce one of my costs. Well, you know where that's going to end up. That's going to end up at a better price for you. There's another dynamic as well that, that I've seen in these conversations with clients that we've been having over the last six months, and that's it's around the CSR angle. That di one, one thing that digital technology allows to happen is a much more efficient connection of one party to another, a finance provider, 
with someone who needs finance, which means that by using digital technology, you can really get finance down to the, vet, to the S of the SME. Mm. And in pretty much every meeting that I've been in, unexpectedly, um, we have spent a significant proportion of that meeting talking about how using a, a digital platform can empower the long tail of suppliers and how that will get your CEO or chairman one step closer to a knighthood because they're supporting government initiatives to get money to SMEs. So that's another way to, um, to get support. I think you've got item number three. Uh, the tea, the meetings, now it's time for you to become a knight. <laughs> there are no, no such thing as a, yeah, as a no, banker not, knight. Not just there? a knighthood. I mean, if any of you in this room are a tier one supplier to government, then somebody very senior in your organisation will have been invited for tea and asked <laughs> what they're doing uh, with supplier finance. So it's about the most politically correct thing you could be doing as an organisation. It is true. Yeah, in response to that as well, yeah. If you're a first tier supplier to the, the government at the moment, you're getting paid in 10 days. Exactly, yeah. Uh, which is costing me as a taxpayer quite a lot of money. I don't really want to be paying for Accenture and, Accent and Oracle to be paid in 10 days. I'm quite happy for small businesses to be paid in that time, and there should be a cost of capital. But paying large organisations in 10 days and coming out of taxpayers' money, yeah, but I th it I think pays for the tea at the Queen. I thought the Americans <laughs> paid for that because they come over here as tourists. Steve, uh, you, had closing, uh, you, you had closing comments going into Q&A. You know you have a few words you want to share. What would you... Uh, what would you advise? On, on, sorry, on... Well, I mean, on, on tea with the Queen, of course. On tea with the Queen. <laughs> um, don't talk football, I would imagine. I don't... I would think. No, actually, the government... I'm quite interested in what's happening in the government at the moment on their, on the, on their supply chain finance initiative. Um, I think it's been very honourable the, what they've tried to do with the SME market. Um, some of the private sector is embarrassing at its contract terms. Uh, however, if you've got long contract terms, it's pretty easy to roll out a very, very powerful supply chain finance initiative because it makes you a lot of money. Uh, the government at the moment, all the councils I speak to, um, have got some finance initiative that thinks they're going to save a fortune through supply chain financing, and yet they're already paying net 10 days in any case. I don't know how they're going to do it, but there's a complete conflict in everything they're doing at the moment around that. So we'll see what happens. I, mean, I, 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 think, I think the government's frustration is it feels it's doing its bit by paying its tier one suppliers on 10 days. What it's not seeing is those tier one suppliers getting the cash down to their tier twos and tier threes. Yeah, I think, frankly, that's where the government's that's frustration point. lies, yeah. which is why they've kind of said, go and do some supply chain financing with your friendly bank at tier one <clears> level, which is fine, because those are likely to be investment grade, good quality. That's a point. But the, the big concern is you get to tier two and, you know, that's not the credit quality all the way across the board. So the big challenge is how do you get the cash flowing to tier twos, threes, fours? That's where the government's really that's, coming from. And that's where I think we'll close in, in the sense that if we have a properly operated marketplace with visibility, someone who is taking cash as a first tier supplier would have the capacity to use that cash to fund their second tier supplier. And the individual at the top of the chain could audit that trail of flows from the first tier to the second tier to the third tier. Uh, and to answer the question I asked you earlier, what is the cost of $3 trillion stranded on the books of your businesses? The answer is in the environment of 300 to $500 billion of your country's GDP. Thank you all very much for being here. The workplace panel on the, on the main stage today was a good, interesting initiative. I come to eWorld most years. I think the panel today was very strong. The subject matter is very, very now. Many of the your purchasing groups are now forming part of the whole P2P process and the working capital process where companies are having to relook at where they release and do something with their cash. So I think the audience was testimony to that. I think there was a very strong audience, a full, full house, so to speak, which is 